Okay, last announcement is happy Grad Student Appreciation Week to all of our grad students. Thank you to Kenny for providing some snacks out in the hallway, so help yourself, take them home. And then next week for seminar, if you remember, it will be held in Munch. Kenny will also be making snacks for that, and it will be a more casual, short research presentation. So if you haven't signed up, um, I sent the link, or you can talk to Dr. Dillon. Uh, it's very casual, no pressure, snacks in between talking about what we've been doing this semester. So, okay, with that, I get to the opportunity to introduce our speaker for this week. So Dr. Chris Minson is the Kenneth and Kenda Singer Professor of Human Physiology at the University of Oregon. His research focuses on topics that are very interesting to me, the integrative cardiovascular physiology in humans. His lab investigates how we can use exposures to extreme environments to gain a healthy and resilient physiology. He's also involved in projects related to endocrine function in women, biomarkers of aging, cardiovascular and metabolic diseases, and finding novel ways to improve thermal comfort and safety in work environments. He's also the co-founder and chief science, science officer of NatureQuat LLC, a data technology company, which is focused on improving health through nature exposure. He also works with elite athletes, utilizing environmental stressors to improve performance. And he and his trainees have been consistently funded by NIH and the American Heart Association. Some of you may remember, we actually met a very successful former trainee of Dr. Minson in this seminar series. Dr. Vienna Bronk came and gave seminar from Colorado, and she was one of his trainees. Dr. Minson has over 120 publications. His work's been cited over 16,000 times, and he's received numerous awards for his research and mentoring of graduate and undergraduate students. For example, he was a 2022 awardee of the University of Oregon Faculty Innovator in Entrepreneurship Award. And to top it all off, he's a wonderful person, a fantastic mentor, which I can speak to. He's actually one of my early career faculty mentors. And we're really thankful he's taken the time. It's going to take him almost three days to get to Mizzou, give seminar, and head back. So he's really given a lot of his time to us. And so we're very thankful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wow, thanks. That was awesome. I like hearing about myself. So, like, you, know, you shouldn't talk about yourself much, right? And then you hear, I'm like, and, and actually, I'm, I started choking up when you started mentioning Vienna. Seriously, I'm doing it again. Um, yeah, so thanks for that. That, that was great. Um, and uh, yeah, my pleasure to be here. It's actually my third time here. Uh, Paul Fidel and uh, Harry, Harold Laughlin invited me out, I think, eight years ago or 10 years or something. We were trying to figure out how long ago that was. And I came again uh, so, so, so in support of you. And so this is great. I'll, I'll, I'll come back anytime, right? It's, you're right, it's a bit of travel, but um, it's not about me coming here giving a talk. It's about people interactions. That's what's so important. That's in, in our field of work, that's what matters more than anything is the people, absolutely. So I'm, I'm awesome to see you all supporting the grad students as well, because without all of you, everything we do goes away. So um, yeah, awesome to see you guys do that. Um, uh, uh, change, change. <laughs> it was working before. I have no idea. It's a drumming thing. Is it? Yeah. Okay. No, that's. So you were trying to be good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering if that's. You can want to do this, maybe. Oh, yeah. you. I the, guess you, you just. There, all right, your aim is better than mine. We'll see. All right. Yeah, good. I got, I got, yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah right. Magic. All right. Great. Fantastic. So um, con conflict of interest, but uh, Jackie mentioned already. Um, I'll, you'll see why this is uh, comes up a little bit later at the end of the talk here. Um, so I wanted to show a quick picture of uh, my campus a bit. Um, track and field is huge in our where we are. We held the, uh, for the first time in American soil, we held the um, uh, world championships for track and field last July. So we had athletes come from all over the world, which is really incredible. It is uh, it, It goes on in there except for track and field, which is great. Um, it was a little bit of a bittersweet because I was there for a long time in historic Hayward Field, which has all this history there, was taken down and this was put in place. And it's a very, very, very different look, but it's really cool, impressive. And most important is that not most important, <laughs> it's important to me is on this far corner over here is we got to design our own labs. So we have a brand new lab space. 
myself, uh, Dr. John Halliwell, and Dr. Uh, Mike Hahn, who's a biomechanist, have some shared space in that corner. We got to design it from the ground up. So as an exercise physiologist at University of Arizona and other places, my biggest fear is that someday I'm going to be stuck in a lab that's in a stadium. But then this is now that's, that's where I ended up, right? After all this time, 22 years at Oregon. And, and um, But we got to design the lab from the start. So it's a little different than being stuck in one that was never designed for that purpose. Um, yeah, so track and field is very big. I do a lot of work with athletes on, in various contexts that will come up here in a little bit. Um, as Jackie mentioned, you know, I'm a, I, I think of myself as an integrated physiologist, but my training is mostly in cardiovascular. Um, and that's where uh, I think I've had probably, probably the, the bigger interest of mine is to look at the cardiovascular. I do some dabbling in metabolic health and other things uh, that gets me in trouble really quick, especially with groups like the one here. Um, so uh, please be nice. Um, but I do um, had a whole bunch of other work here uh, for many years in vascular autonomic function in women. And that's what I gave a talk on last time when I was here. I got through half of it. And then Dr. Siegel started asking me questions. And I never finished the second half of the talk. But I, I, I had fun, at least. I think people got bored after a while. But but, uh, um, uh, but a lot of my group areas have also been in thermoregulation, especially um, like the, the basic mechanisms of cutaneous blood flow, very basic science research, but just really, really cool. Um, but I do a lot of now focusing also on a lot of environmental stress, acclimation, as well as uh, exercise performance and certainly the health benefits associated with thermoregulation. So um, I'm, I'm really am, I used to say like I, I get easily distracted by bright, shiny objects, but I think it's probably better description. I'm, I'm kind of like a, a squirrel on, on crack or something because I'm like, I just get so excited about everything, zipping around for everything. And, and, and it's it, it gets me in trouble sometimes, but that's the way I, I like it. And that's the way I, I keep things rolling. So um Again, but the thing I found is that I have to collaborate with people smarter than me because there's, you, you, unless you're very narrow focused, there's going to be someone who knows more about things than you do. So you can only learn from them. So coming here, I learn a ton from, from everybody else in this group. So it's fantastic. Um, so jumping in a little bit here, um, the way I kind of think about things is that, you know, not that long ago, we'll call it three and a half billion years ago. It seems like a long time to us, but that's not that long ago, really. We were basically just becoming the first cells, right? And at that time, the world is a very hostile place. But the world is still a hostile place. So everywhere we've ever been from our evolution all the way on up, we have been surrounded by our environment. And this environment has an impact on us, and we have to relate to that environment in some way, right? So then, but then we fast kind of forward to uh, more modern human history, right? Um, it wasn't that long ago, really, especially in geologic time when we were doing this, where we're starting to uh, do a little bit more comfort for ourselves by by using our big brains to kill animals and wear their skins to keep us warm, uh, working in groups, actually building some fire to make ourselves more comfortable. Um, then, then we moved about 100 years ago. This is kind of the, the status of the United States and certainly most of the world um, 100 years ago you were still really in touch with the environment. You might've had a fireplace in that. In that, You can keep warm at night, but you couldn't have enough fire in most places to keep it going all the time. Certainly no air conditioning. Um, if you're gonna go to town or whatever, you have to go a long ways. You're gonna be exposed to the environment. You paid really, really, really close attention to the environment around you. And, and that's not the case anymore, right? We're now in what's called the urban century. We're living in an environment that is drastically different from 99.9, .9, however nines you wanna take that out, of, of human history. And it's so dramatic change that we now spend 95% of our time indoors and 50% of Americans do not go outside for activity or exercise. And this is a little bit of an old stat here that the average child spends just four hours a week outside. That's half of what their parents spent, but you know what? It's probably a lot less than that for most kids, right? Um, it's amazing how, how little they actually spend time outside. So that's changed things quite a bit. And our big brains get us in trouble. Right. We've decided to use the big brains to make ourselves even more and more and more comfortable. So we go from, you know, when it's really hot outside, we get into our air conditioned car and we zip as quick as we can and to the air conditioned office. Too cold. We we get into our into our, our cars and we turn up the heat. We go home. We have it have it cranked for nice and heat. Right. This all looks lovely. Right. But I do believe that we are becoming living in a state of thermostasis. And I don't think that's good. I think pushing the envelope and getting breaking ourselves out of comfort is critically important to the human condition and to human health. And so um, in addition to that, you know, we're more connected than we've ever been to the rest of the world. We're also more disconnected to each other. And so we live in, in to certainly to, to the natural environment. These are how many cities look now. I mean, you don't see anything natural in that environment, right? You see this kind of picture all the time. I love when I travel. 
just watching people stand up next to each other and just have their faces on their little death sticks, right? This, these things. And all these people are together, but they're not together. They're connected to maybe other people through different ways, but they're probably checking their status on this, that, or the other, and they're getting stressed and frustrated. That's not, not healthy. It's not natural for us. Um, so that's why so many people are looking more like this, right? Um, people are people are are having um, in in isolation. They're more connected, living in isolation, and more depression, all those kind of things. So if you look at the mental health in the United States, this only goes to 2017. But look what happened between uh, 2009 and 2017, right? Especially in the younger population, that's huge increases in depression rates, massive. And this is before that. Um, what happened right after that time? Right, the pandemic, right? The pandemic made things worse. So you look at um, at things like uh, symptoms of anxiety disorder or depressive disorder or combined, and and look, this is just from January 2019 to December 2020. These numbers have 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 increased, and now the pandemic's over, right? I think sort of. I think officially it's been declared down, but we're still kind of living in it, and a lot of the impacts of it are still there. One of those impacts is that people are not becoming less depressed. Anxiety rates are continuing to increase. The number of um, any of us doing human subjects, if you, we really need to be thinking about, are we studying su student subjects on SSRIs, right? Because if you're excluding them, then your, your window of who you're studying has gone way down. If you're including them, well, that's a pill you're taking that has a major physiological function, right? I don't have the answer to that, so don't ask that question. Um, but it's a really difficult thing to do, but it's something that's that's changing for us, and it's not, not healthy. And we all know that that anxiety, depression, chronic stress, all those things lead to stroke, heart failure, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease. Those are intimately related. And if you have all those conditions, they feed back to anxiety, depression, and chronic stress, and everything else. So this is modern diseases we have. Um, again, I've highlighted cardiovascular disease here because it's the one that I know the best, but it's also the one that more people are dying from. And I'm sure everyone who comes here says, you know, cardiovascular disease is terrible in the United States, and, and the number's going to get worse by 20 of this, 80, 70 percent are people going to have hypertension, and they're not wrong at this point. The rates are going that way, right? So we're not getting any better. Um, and of course, you know, uh, obesity and diabetes are major contributors to this cardiometabolic disease, and all these are linked to Alzheimer's disease risk and conditions. So um, yeah, bottom line is people are just not getting healthier. Um, we, I, we'd like to think we're having a major impact, but we're not, we're understanding things a lot better, but I'm not sure we're impacting things the way that we should using those big brains to make big improvements. So my kind of central thesis here is that humans have become too physically comfortable, too mentally stressed and too removed from nature and each other. And I do believe that that's a problem. It's a major problem, right? And I don't think probably too much disagreement with that. Um, so the, thing, the, the approach for me for a while, probably the last, gosh, 15 years, weird saying that, um, is really asking the question in both my professional life and my personal life, can we use environmental and or nature exposures to target these modern diseases? That's been my goal and kind of the driving aspect of, uh, of my, my lab and my work. And so I, this is probably too simplistic for, for this group, but I never really know. I want to make sure we're all on the same kind of same page, but you know, what mechanisms underlie cardiovascular disease? And you know, there's, we know there's these modifiable and non-modifiable uh, risk factors, and, and all this can impact uh, vascular function, and that can lead to cardiovascular disease. In the lab, we we're going to look at things like endothelial dysfunction, arterial stiffness. Those are going to be factors that lead into increasing blood pressure, and that's going to be one of the central functions of cardiovascular disease. We also look, of course, at sympathetic overactivity, which works these mechanisms as well. And we also look at kidney dysfunction. Um, my, uh, my current postdoc right now is a, a kidney expert, and so I'm learning, I'm learning what I don't know about the kidney, which is a lot. And so, but it's a, you know, kidney disease is a, is a major, major factor and it plays into cardiovascular disease. And there's a group in um, Mississippi who I think they believe that the kidney underlies blood pressure. I'm not sure I agree. I'm just kidding. But um, yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so, so uh, you know, this rises in blood pressure are, are, are creating all kinds of massive problems that underlies a lot of this cardiovascular disease. So, so what underlies the vascular dysfunction? Um, again, this is for this group, I think this is way too simplistic, but you know, I, I think you know, we're chasing all these different uh, modalities to improve health, 
from pharmaceuticals to nutraceuticals to uh, this exercise versus that exercise versus heat therapy, cold stress, blah, 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 stuff I'll talk about today. And really what the end of the day, we're talking about this relationship between oxidative stress right? And inflammation and how there's this big circle that kind of goes back and around and around. I don't want to, uh, other than one little part. So we can dive down into these topics as much as people want later in discussion. But, um, but this kind of, this, this is where we're all, we're all kind of chasing that to some degree. There are, yes, there are other places. Oh, what about this kinase? What about that? What about mTOR? What about AKT? Well, right. It's right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. hundred percent. But this comes back to this. This is what, uh, this is where in my simplistic world, that's, what we're talking about. Doug Seals is a really good friend of mine. And, and, you know, he has all these different things he's doing with aging and I, chasing. And he's like, yeah, so I'm like, okay, cool. Okay, cool. As long as we're, as long as we're on the same page. Right. And just, but there's different strategies for different things, but um, so this is kind of way I look at, at what's happening with uh, uh, vascular dysfunction that leads to the cardiovascular disease. And of course, nitric oxide is central to that. Right. There's many, many, you know, what about EDHF? What about, yeah, yeah, right, right. But this is the, the one of the really big players. I don't think anyone would argue too much that. Um, I have a question for you. How, how can we yell it out? How can we prevent cardiovascular disease? Exercise. So, yeah, I was, I was worried someone's going to say, you know, in this group, I was like, nutrition, almonds. <laughs> You know, I was like, I wasn't sure I was going to get here for sure. Um, and everybody's right, of course. But when we kind of think about it as an exercise physiologist, I think about exercise, right? And and uh, Dr. Parks and I had a discussion earlier, and, and um, I don't think we answered the question, but it's like, is it better to, if you took some people and stopped them exercising, is that healthier than having someone overeat, or less healthy than having someone overeat? Or is it like, I don't, I don't know what the exact answer is, but I can tell you that um, for myself, if I don't exercise, Things go pear shaped. Well, I go pear shaped, but then <laughs> first dad joke there. Um, but then um, there'll be many <laughs> physiology dad joke. Um, the uh, uh, but I know my happiness is tied to it. I know that my my contentment is tied to it. And and as, as we discussed, um, it's really really hard to give up good food. You're taking away something that's pleasurable. So from my perspective, exercise is is going to be is going to help you if you don't have the best diet. Exercise is going to be helpful if you um, if you have all the other situations, exercise is almost always going to be something that's going to be helpful. So the question for me became, well, why is exercise good? And I'm not trying to, this is minimizing it completely because books are written on this stuff, right? Um, in fact, I'm reading a book now, well, <laughs> reading, meaning listening on audio tape when I bike commute in, um, the book called Exercise. Um, it's fantastic uh, by, um, oh my gosh, standing up here, I forgot his name. I'll come up with it. Um, uh, the biological anthropologist at Harvard. Anyway, um, uh, whole book on it. it's a fantastic book. And if you like metabolic stuff, his student did a book called Burn, which is Herman Ponser did a fantastic, great, really good, readable book by people. So similar, similar vein of that. Um, but so what, why is exercise healthy? Well, we increase heart rate, cardiac output, blood flow. We know that's all really good. That change that causes an increase in shear stress, increases nitric oxide. I'll talk about that in a moment. Bottom line from all that, we get stronger hearts, we get more beneficial vascular remodeling, right? But we also, you can't, it's almost impossible to exercise without raising your body temperature. Very, very hard to do it. We're big chunks of meat and, and we know 75% of all our energy goes to, to gets turned to heat to get that 25% of work out of us. So we generate a lot of heat, right? Um, and from that, we get increased um, expression of these things called heat shock proteins, which I think are really, really, really important. And I'll talk about those briefly. And from that, we get cellular adaptations. We also get an acute reduction in blood pressure that we think is really, really important. My colleague, John Halliwell has been focused on this for a very long time and he's dragged me into it as well. Uh, not dragged me, brought me along, um, encouraged me to join him in that. And you know, there, of course, there's all on the psychological side of things as well, the increased mood, the decreased anxiety, improved uh, mental health. So all of these things are great benefits of exercise, right? Let's tap down on those a little bit more. So I'd really be remiss to show up here in Missouri and not talk about um, some of the, the 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 giant shoulders we've stood on, those of us doing vascular function, that includes Dr. Harold Laughlin, who I've cited here, who did really did a fantastic job looking at, you know, what is why are endothelial cells healthy? How do we make them healthier? How does the 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 pattern of blood flow going through our blood vessels, how is that associated with with better health? And we know from his work and, and others that, you know, if we have this, this is like a ultrasound trace here. And this, this line, everything, anything above that line is, is forward moving blood flow. Anything below that is, is, is backwards moving flow. 
Um, and we know that that pattern is not healthy. And that's the pattern you're all in right this very minute. Right, it's sitting there. So we know it's going to decrease nitric oxide bioavailability, increase alpha adrenergic vasoconstriction, be associated with increased pro-inflammatory factors. But it's you know it's it's really not the healthy profile to be in. But if we can have these intermittent increases in antegrade shear, so more forward shear, not so much at antegrade retrograde, right? We know that's going to be associated with increased nitric oxide bioavailability, decreased vasoconstrictors. Um, increasing anti anti-inflammatory and decreased oxidative stress. All these kind of things, which we know are associated with healthier vasculature, right? Um, and that happens during exercise and it happens for a period of time after exercise and you, then you go back. So that's some of the cute things that happen after exercise that we know help with improved vascular remodeling. I mentioned these heat shock proteins too. They're, they're really aptly named and terribly named at the same time. Um, and I put this up here because uh, I love this from uh, one of uh, Doug Seal's former postdocs, uh, Kevin Kriegel. Um, uh, you know, we think of heat shock proteins in, in the name hyperthermia, right? So when they're, they're first described. But these proteins in the number, which is great, is, it tells you about the size of them. So HSP70, HSP72, 70, 72 Daltons, 90, 90 Daltons, 27, 27 Daltons. Fantastic. Makes it simple for a guy like me. Right, but the truth is, these things are response to hypothermia, ischemia, reperfusion, hypoxia, hyperoxia, energy depletion, acidosis, vital protection, um, uh, oxygen species, nitrogen species, um, and so uh, these acute stresses cause this HSP to dissociate from its HSP factor. That HSP then has protective factors. It's a chaperone. It helps to um, stabilize proteins. It helps to move things around. It helps to um, take stress denatured proteins and help them refold back in the way they're supposed to be. Have all these kind of healthy things. These, I mentioned, mentioned before, when we were floating around single-celled organisms in that primordial soup, right? We had heat shock proteins. They were there. They're that old. They're that conserved. That's how important they are, right? Dr. Kelly will tell you that his team was there too. I'm like, well, whatever. Um, but um, so we have a lot of stuff there that we still have. But but that's why some cell culture work stuff really actually still works. We're still not that far from that. Um, but then the heat shock protein, when it dissociates to the stress, the heat shock factor then goes through um, the 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 isom triom triomerization that goes in through the uh, transcription into into the translation. Then we get a lot more HSP. So that's kind of where you have this acute stress of exercise, and then you have the recovery period to talk about, and then you go back and then you start doing the um, the next bout, the next bout, next bout. Well, like other things, like we said, heat the the endothelial function, heat shock proteins are having the same thing. They're becoming more upregulated in our system, helping on on every single cell has heat shock proteins in them. So it's 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 a they're really really important, and they were super super popular to talk about a while, and they kind of fell out of favor, and now they're coming back again, which is kind of exciting for me. Um, and so one of the things that heat shock proteins do as far as like, um, this is kind of a silly picture in some ways, but I've got the vascular smooth muscle here, um, and the endothelium here in the middle, so it's not to scale, right? And then the, the sorry, another bad, bad physiology joke. Um, and then the blood vessel up here. So we, the, most of you probably know this pathway, right? Um, ENOS or the other nitric oxide synthesis help you convert L-arginine to L-citrulline, produce nitric oxide. If you've got these uh, superoxides, these bad things that we think are always bad, but of course, exercise produces a lot of them, right? Um, we could get a bunch of these, then and they, they will break up nitric oxide into um, this peroxynitrate. When you get a lot of those, what do you say? Oh, no. Third bad physiology dad joke, right? Um, and and so we also have all those pro-inflammatory cytokines, right? And so, but heat shock protein 90 upregulates is essential cofactor for ENOS, right? So if you've got more heat shock protein 90 around, you've got more uh, ability to, to liberate uh, nitric oxide. Um, you can increase uh, nitric oxide bioavailability. Uh, HP70 um, also increases superoxide dismutase. In our models, we've, we've done this in, in, we've seen this in, in blood from humans. We've seen this also with uh, our cell culture models. Right, you increase superoxide dismutase, and that way you can take those nasty uh, superoxide free radicals, and and you 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 turn them into something that's another signaling molecule molecule of just um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, right? And so something that's that's uh, more benign. Um, they also affect our so they're antioxidant, um, but they're also anti-inflammatory, right? They're going to directly block some of these things, and also have direct effects within this vascular smooth muscle as well to decrease some of these things associated with decreased vascular health. So they're, they're really involved in a lot of things. I hope I convince you of that much uh, by that by that distraction there. Um, so, but the thing is, is you know, I, I mentioned like how, you know, for a long time we thought these, you know, free radicals and oxidative stress, those are bad things, right? 
But when you exercise, you generate a whole bunch of them. Anytime you go through metabolism, you're going, you're, you're generating free radicals, right? So they can't all be bad. So the question becomes, when are they bad? And that's when they're in excess. And we all know that all the factors we talked, I showed before that contribute and many more that contribute to the, the excess of these, of these problems. Um, but the real big thing also is recovery, right? So if we don't have recovery, then, then a stress becomes a chronic stress and that becomes unhealthy and we have dysregulation. So my goal has been really to look at thermal, metabolic, hypoxic, ox oxidative, mechanical, inflammatory stressors, right? And, and then apply them in various models by we have the stress, then recovery, we repeat, stress, recovery, repeat, stress, recovery, repeat, to the time where it gets pushed over to adaptation. And all these things happen where the nice thing at the end, we end up with improved stress resistance and improved resilience, right? But there has to be that active recovery phase. And that's what underlies performance adaptations. So I work with a lot of uh, elite athletes, including Jessica Hull here. She's actually uh, moved on and she's um, one of Australia's top 1500 meter runners. Um, but, uh, you know, with her and a bunch of other athletes, I'm using these stimuli to help improve her performance. I'm not trying to make her healthier per se, because she's pretty, pretty bloody healthy, right? Um, but then when we take our patient populations or our sedentary groups, we're using the same type of stresses to try and do the same thing, try and stress them and make them healthier, make their stress, um, their, their vasculature, their metabolic system more resistant and more resilient. Um, and, but the, the, the key part is that recovery, that recovery phase is so, so critically important. So how can we prevent cardiovascular disease? Exercise, right? The problem is there's many patient populations with limited exercise capacities or capabilities. Uh, the elderly, the frail, heart failure, peripheral artery disease, very painful for them to exercise. Um, there's a lot of uh, physiological as well as psychological reasons why people with diabetes and obesity, polycystic ovary syndrome we talked about before, uh, people with spinal cord injury, um, uh, amputees, and people's lacking motivation. There's a lot of, you know, Realistically, Mike Tchaikovsky, I was a, he's a PhD, I started postdoc for me at Mayo Clinic when I was there. And he one point turned me and I was like, I was getting some work done. I was pretty happy with myself. Right? He turns to me, he goes, why are we doing all this? I'm like, what? He's like, why shouldn't we all be doing psycho psychology and just getting people to exercise and eat healthier? Shouldn't we, that shouldn't, have, why, are they, why are we applying for funding for this stuff? And I was like, damn it. <laughs> right now, I was like, now what do I do? I can't work. I just... <laughs> Right. And he, he's right to some degree, except he's wrong. But, you know, but I, I, in that moment, I, I kind of like, dang, he's, he's, he's right. Because we know things are healthy. Right. And I know people in this room, myself as well, have had reviewers kind of say, well, why are you studying exercise? We know it's healthy. I'm like, well, yeah, but uh, right. And, and so but I do start asking the question, not everyone's going to exercise. And, and the more I talked, like I've done some work with spinal cord injury and it's in a, a spinal cord injured athlete is going to have a similar vascular profile as a sedentary able-bodied individual. And that's tragic, in my opinion, right? Really, really sad. So what can we do? What can we do, right? We need alternatives or we need adjunctive. So we can take someone who exercises and boost their ability a little better, like get done with the athletes, right? So what can we do? Heat therapy, right? So again, repetitive acute stresses can drive physiological adaptation, right? And who wouldn't want to party with these ladies? I mean, seriously. Um, so like, you've already seen the slide, I'm not going to go through it again, but like exercise, repetitive acute heat stress may lead to long-term adaptation. I would actually say now does lead to long-term adaptation. All the things on the left side, that happens with heat stress, acute heat stress. All the stuff on the right side, that happens with acute heat stress. I mean, it does, it's on the top, right? Increased body temperature, right? Um, we see acute reductions in blood pressure following an acute bout of uh, heat, of heat heat therapy, we call it heat stress, right? We see increased mood, de decreased anxiety, improved mental health with, with heat therapy. So again, it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of a no duh thing when I started doing it, I'm like, well, I think it's gonna work, right? But we didn't know for sure. There's a lot of things still have to be addressed. But I can't tell you what our, what our, our approach has been. Um, so we've taken a number of different groups and we've expanded on this even since I put the slide together a little bit. But we're looking at people who are sedentary, uh, people who have hypertension, uh, uh, people who are obese and including separately uh, women with PCOS um, or PCOS, some people like to say, um, and, uh, and older individuals. And so all these different populations we're, we're, we're studying and trying to put this application through, right? And we're in these, these groups here, we're also looking at biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, there's uh, my good friend and um, it's a brilliant physiologist, uh, Paige Geiger up at, Can up, up at over some, somewhere near here in Kansas. Yeah, I know it's in Kansas, but I'm trying to do up or down, right? I wasn't sure. Left, to the left, she's left, she's West Coast, West Dish. 
Um, she's she has just got a, a she's gonna brag about this. She's got an R one funded looking at Alzheimer's and using heat therapy. So it's I mean, she's 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 gonna really do some fantastic stuff. And so we're we're working on that. Um, but we don't do it nearly as well. She's gonna bang out of the park. We, we got some cool stuff, but she's gonna do even, do even better. Really, really cool stuff. Um, so our, our general approach for these studies have been to randomize um, and sometimes have to assign people to groups um, to experimental or sham. Um, when I say assign, sometimes it's a tricky one, but um, you're all doing human research to understand this. Sometimes you get someone who says, I really, really wanna be in your study, but I can't commit to the time. And if you're looking for someone with a clinical condition, sometimes you have to then do assignment to groups, right? And this is not ideal. And as long as you're honest with that when you publish, which of course you should be, then you have to be, um, then then it's, it's not as strong, strong a model, but the reality, see you stand back and say, you should randomize everybody. I'm like, well, yeah, I get it, but we're life, right? Yeah. So um, and then we do a whole bunch of uh, vascular measurements. These include things like endothelial function, arterial stiffness, intermediate thickness, um, in clinic and 24 hour blood pressures, oral glucose tolerance tests, uh, sympathetic activity, adipose. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit that. <laughs> uh, uh, we take adipose and we're taking skeletal muscle biopsies and studies now. Um, then we take a bunch of blood samples for biomarkers and heat shock proteins. We then harvest endothelial cells or do um, uh, uh, HUVEC cells and other types of cell culture stuff, right? Then we do in vivo and ex vivo um, measuring of uh, HSP content, oxidative stress, inflammatory markers, all that kind of stuff like that. Like this is nothing, this is stuff that, that, that can pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, we're doing such cool stuff. It's the same stuff like <laughs> Jami is doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, he's doing this, a lot of you are doing this kind of stuff, right? So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's cool. And then our model is then we then put them through um, about 30 sessions of heat therapy. And we use either hot water immersion or we use dry sauna or we use, which is the kind of finished sauna, uh, traditional sauna, or we use the far infrared sauna. I was going to go into different types of the heat therapy. We can talk about that later. There are different, have different physiology. And when I'm working with athletes, I try and use different ones, depending on what their, what their situation is, trying to manage their training loads and their legs and a bunch of other things. So it's, it's there's a lot of really cool stuff. We could spend the whole time talking about that if people want to. Um, then we test them, bring them back in the lab and test them again. We typically do a midpoint of some of the tests and then do it and do, but pre and post is kind of the main thing with some midpoint tests. So, so basically I stole what people do in exercise and I just said, okay, we'll, we'll heat them up. Right. So not really exactly that, uh, that deep thoughts, but, but a lot of work. Um, and so rather than showing you a whole ton of graphs, I'm just going to tell you that these are the kind of things we've seen. It's very, very consistent with what you see with exercise. We've seen fairly consistently reduced blood pressure, improved endothelium-dependent dilation, and that includes both of the conduit vessels as well as the microvasculature. Um, we've seen testing it multiple different ways, reduced arterial stiffness. Sometimes you see in certain vessels versus other vessels, and we're still trying to understand when does it affect this vessel or that vessel. Um, reduced intimate media thickness we've seen, as well as uh, lowered sympathetic outflow in, in people with uh, elevated sympathetic outflow, which has been really, really cool. The bottom line from that is we're seeing robust improvements in cardiovascular health, really, really, truly robust improvements. On the metabolic side of things, um, we've seen reduced inflammation in adipose tissue, um, improved signaling in the skeletal muscle and adipose tissue, and including reduced inflammatory cytokines and oxidized LDLs, uh, free fatty acids, and, and uh, circulating CRP. Um, we've seen improved glucose levels and glucose regulation using uh, like OGTTs and looking at the insulin and, and um, uh, glucose uh, pathways in there or a, a response to that. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, uh, all this occurring in the absence of weight loss. Right. So people always ask me, well, did we, they lose weight? Like, no, people didn't lose weight in the obese groups when they're doing this. That's not a surprise because even exercise alone doesn't doesn't make a big difference in weight in weight loss in most studies, and certainly it comes right back, right? So sometimes it can be done. But um, yeah, but bottom line is robust improvements in metabolic health. So I'm at a place now where I don't talk about, I used to kind of present this data and show all the graphs and say, look, we're starting to see this kind of thing, but there's enough people doing it. I've been really trying to encourage everyone to do heat therapy. And it's, it's kind of funny how, how, how people tease me about it now. Like, like, you know, like you're the, you're the heat miser. You're going to try and make everybody do it. I'm like, well, did you think about heat though? Right. It's like, yeah. So just think about it, think about it, do it. And I've had some, uh, some people, some more colleagues and others say, I kind of want to do heat, but I don't want to step on your toes. I'm like, Oh my God. All right. It's like going, like me going, Jackie, I don't want to step on your toes by doing some, some exercise stuff, you know, it's like, <laughs> or hypoxia, right. I don't want, yeah, no, I know you're doing hypoxia. I'm like, this, that's not a thing, right. We all need to do it. So everybody needs to be doing heat and tone, right? So, um, so one of the questions we need to ask though is do these improvements in biomarkers of vascular function from these short-term lab-based studies 
um, translate into meaningful reductions in disease or death. And just by dumb luck, um, right in the time we started to publish our studies, uh, Yari Laukinen and, and the, some of the Spanish group have started publishing their big data um, that are looking at sauna bathing, because in, in Finland, there's uh, one sauna for every four people as part of their culture, right? They use it a ton and they have reasonable heart disease and cardiovascular disease risk, and yet they smoke a lot. So on balance, they're actually doing pretty well. Um, and so uh, in this study, they, they followed 2,315 middle-aged Finnish men for over 20 years. So it's a prospective study. So all this uh, looking at people at, at, you know, at, at enrollment, and then they can follow them and see how long they're going to live right after that. What's the problem with the study? No women in this, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm glad that someone said that. Nice kudos, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah, so um, yeah, that's that's a problem, right? Um, and so if you're not least you're looking at cumulative hazard scores here, but basically this is deaths. This is people. This is your risk of dying based on people who are dead, right? They're pushing daisies. They're not coming back. So they're looking over these these period of time, right? So unfortunately, they don't have a control group with no sauna because it's Finland, <laughs> so everyone's using the sauna and at enrollment. And um, they showed that um, for those who only use sauna one times per week versus two to three times per week versus four to seven times per week, um, your risk of dying is much, much less the more often you're using sauna, okay? And this is after controlling and all the crazy statistical models of socioeconomic status, in, uh, exercise enrollment, um, uh, where they live, I mean, all these different factors, they, they try and put into everything control it, right? It's not 100% perfect, but it's, it's pretty darn good. They also looked at the sauna duration per session. And basically, the longer you're in the sauna, the more uh, the 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 less risk you have of dying as well from these studies. And again, this is actual death, so it's pretty powerful um, type of uh, study, pretty convincing. And so the bottom line from this is that both the frequency and duration per session of sauna use were associated with reduced cardiovascular um, mortality, sudden cardiac death, hypertension, and and all, and they have papers now on Alzheimer's disease as well. So really they're being, these people are a lot, lot healthier, even after taking consideration as many different factors as the comorbidities and core factors, um, uh, covariates in this. So it's a pretty, pretty powerful study, I think. And they've got more studies coming out with it. So, so um, yeah, I think it's pretty convincing. Um, a lot of Japanese groups have used, um, uh, uh, they haven't done this kind of long-term study, but they, they, they do something um, where they, where it's, uh, it's called WAN therapy and WAN means soothing warm heat. And it's, they, they basically put people in infrared saunas for about, uh, 30 minutes and they have more warm blankets for another 30 minutes. And in many patient groups, they've shown all kinds of improvements. So in very sick, uh, cardiac patients, uh, heart failure in all kinds of groups are seeing improvements in, in biomarkers of cardiovascular health. So more evidence that, that in real world situations, this is making a, a difference in, in people. Um, yeah, so hopefully I've convinced you that that heat works, right? But every time I talk about heat, someone goes, well, what about cold? And cold right now is anybody on TikTok, right? You go on TikTok, it's like, I mean, every, at least for me, it seems like every everybody's doing cold right now, right? Right? You have to, you're doing it, right? I think I've seen you. I've seen you. Yeah. I've seen you in your skivvies getting in your little thing, knocking the rack. Yeah. 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 So it's really, really popular right now. It's crazy. I mean, it's, I, I start thinking like, is everybody doing it? Cause I've, I've done a whole bunch of cold stress. I get, you know, like, I really like testing, pushing myself and seeing if I'm going to ask people to do something or advocate for something, I got to try it myself. Um, the, the challenge is there's start looking at how much stuff there is in cold, right? There's not that much research at all on it. Yes. Uh, browning of uh, Beijing of, of white fat and uh, increases in brown adipose tissue. Yes. Those have some health benefits. Brown adipose tissue is more healthy. Yes. You can increase some of the brown adipose tissue maybe, but then you can certainly beige your white adipose tissue. That's more metabolically active, right? Separate, separate cell lines, by the way, from those. Um, uh, and so, um, but that's, that's going to take a lot and a lot of time, and it's it's going to be something that may underlie some of the the health benefits. I didn't really want to talk about that per se because I don't. I mean, I teach that in my class, but I don't I don't study that directly myself. Um, but there may be some benefits to that. I do think some of the cold stress stuff comes back down to heat shock proteins. These things are powerful, and they are absolutely. We have some cell culture stuff we've been we did during the pandemic that we need to circle back around and publish. Um, where we've done some cold stress and heat stress and mixing cold and you know contrast heating colding and trying to drive up heat shock proteins and a bunch of 
uh, uh, nitric oxide and other other pathways to get activated. Um, and so um, go, I'm not going to go through this again, of course, because same thing, but I'm showing the hypothermia. So I do believe that some of the cold benefits that people will start seeing is going to be secondary to the um, uh, heat shock protein adaptations. And we've also, uh, we have a paper we're going to be submitting pretty soon that has, we've seen some, some positive benefits in the brachial artery as far as the shear patterns I mentioned before too with it, right? But they're not, they're not profound, not, not nearly as, as profound as the heat, but are we doing the right one? Are we doing the right distance? Are we doing the dark time? Are we dunking the head? Are we not dunking the head? I mean, it's so many, like, like, right? It's like exercise. What's the best exercise for you? Biking, running, cycling, that's the same as biking, sorry. Skiing, uh, uh, lifting weights, combination there, what high intensity. I mean, same same issue. We're way behind on the exercise stuff. We haven't even figured the exercise out. What's the ideal, best, perfect exercise for everybody, right? Probably going to be individualized more than anything. Yeah. So you might have heard of this guy, Wim Hof the ice man, right? The guy's a complete kook, but it doesn't make him wrong. And I really like him, right? And he's taking this whole whole idea of, he's a world record holder for some uh, ice, uh, uh, some some physiological stresses on ice. Um, but they've also done some studies on him and this they talked about in this book here, um, what doesn't kill us. He's not, and he'll be the first to tell you, he's not special, right? He just he put himself through and is part of that mental training. So I think those of you who are getting up in the morning and jumping in the cold bath, Right there, it's it's the same thing. I mean, I I was doing the cold showers and I challenged my students to this cold shower challenge. I can tell you about it later if people are interested. But it's really hard in the shower and you're like warm. Like, oh, this is nice. And like six o'clock in the morning and now I got to drop the temperature. And I'm like, oh my god, right? This is gonna suck. I'm like, no, no, I'm not gonna do it. Okay, okay. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. So you you have to change your mind. So you gotta be like, just, just do it, right? Get in there. And there's something about that. Now you've accomplished something for the day, right? And you get through and then you feel how amazing. You feel, all right, it's amazing. It's, my dad would always say, it's like hitting yourself on the head of the hammer. It feels good when you stop. I'm like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I think it really freaking hurts. But but that's the that's the that's the thing though. I think that there is some like I've accomplished something. But um uh yeah, and so he's combining some hyperventilation as well as some breath hold stuff. And I I've, I've played with the hyperventilation, um, either either CO2 tolerance versus O2 tolerance, um, as well as uh, a bunch of other things like that. Cause I just like I just like Next dad joke, probably the fourth one. I like playing with myself. And so that you can you can learn a lot of physiology by doing that. You really can. You guys got to put yourself and do it, right? Um, and so um, this is a, a, a very quick, this is a, a study we kind of put together during the pandemic. We were super limited. Um, we were shut down for a better part of 18 months. When they started letting us come in, they're like, you can have a subject in the lab for one hour, but you can only be within six feet of them for 15 minutes. And we're just like, all right, what? So we designed a study. Um, was not far from ideal, but it was basically, you know, we basically brought people in, we dumped them in cold water for 15 minutes, we then had CD recovery for 30 minutes, and then they had they left, had to come back um, after three hours. And we were looking at a few different things. And Dr. Canale, I'm sorry, I promised I wouldn't, but well, yeah, <laughs> it's got four graphs in one slide. We're talking about that. So I, I really try not to do that, but um, but but this is really simple. We've got baseline, we've got the time frame down here so everyone can follow along. This is the these things here, right? So um, serum cortisol uh, by three hours dropped. And this we, and you're saying, well, was it circadian rhythm? Well, we started all different kinds of times because of the pandemic, we were just barely surviving, right? So I don't know what we did with circadian rhythm. We did our best we can. That's my answer for it. Um, but we started people at very different times. This is the most consistent thing we saw. Stress level of cortisol was down after uh, three hours when they came back into the lab, okay, consistently. Um, we didn't see any serum uh, beta endorphins. That's the happy hormones, right? Ones that make you feel really good. Um, and we didn't see, we looked at a bunch of others. I'm just kind of showing you a couple here. Um, and we looked at, we did some psychological uh, scaling as well. And it's mostly because I was an undergrad in psych and I pretend like I know what I'm doing, but I really don't. And um, I, I'm still fascinated by, by the brain. And so I talked to people who are smarter than me and they said, this is a very simple, I said, what can we do during the pandemic where they can do it from 10 feet away from us? And they said, do the do the uh, uh, this uh, PANAS schedule. Um, and it's basically there's positive affect and negative affect. Unfortunately, affect looks like effect, which is unfortunate for me because I was stumbling that. Um, we didn't see people feel better afterwards, even though we know people do, right? But this is during the pandemic, no one's feeling good. So what we did see is a fairly consistent drop in people feeling less negative, which was interesting. I think people's feeling pretty bad during the pandemic. We're like, well, we're gonna call that a success, right? So um, there's a little more information and data like this in the literature, but not much. And we really need to do a lot more. 
people are always, always ask me, why are you doing all the cold stress stuff? I'm like, because people really, most people really don't like it. They really, really don't like it, right? But those who like it and stick with it, love it and swear by it, right? They become Wim Hoffers, you could say, all right? Yeah, so the reaction, exercise stress we're not recovering we've got problems right things aren't things aren't going well and we're not gonna have these great adaptations that we want so um the problem is this is me we're well, okay not me but pretend it's me here right um i wake up in the morning and i, I first thing i usually do my i might use my phone for alarm and of course i got these notifications so i try and shut off i can't figure out how to do it the right way so i'm somehow still getting notifications through and then i sometimes check the you know then i get up and i'm kind of wandering around then i get some news feed I'm like oh what's going on in the world and then i oh got that text like or a email, check my email real quick, just going to see what the day is going to be like, or if I even go in and check my my calendar for the day, what time do I got to be in, right? Then I start getting stressed out, right? So the, I'm going to get my workout in really quick, so I go and exercise really, really quick as fast as I can in the morning, and then I shove food down my pie hole as quick as I can. I'm usually doing something while I'm doing it, right? Then I go back to work, and I'm tired, and I'm exhausted, I'm, and I'm stressing out, and then I get home, and I'm tired, and I'm going to eat, and then I'm like, I'm gonna go to bed, but I've had such, I need to relax my brain. I'm gonna look at my phone for a little while. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch videos, right? So the long story short is where's the recovery? I mean, this is like, this is this is like every grad student, right? I think pretty much like this, right? And, and every pre-tenure and post-tenure faculty and everything, right? It's, this, is, this is the academic life we live. It's the life a lot of people live, right? So we're not recovering. So the problem with that is stress without recovery, lack of sleep, poor nutrition, mental stress, anxiety, illness, all these things, result in all these chronic at, uh, at activation of these stress response pathways, chronic elevations in reactive octane species, chronic low grade inflammation, right? Um, all of these kind of problems that get completely disrupted, chronic sympathetic overactivity, all these things we know are horrible with us, right? So that ends up in poor performance, poor mental health, poor physical health and leads to disease, right? So, so it's easy. All we gotta do is say, well, just sleep more, right? Don't stress so much. Right, right. How do you do that? Right? How do you find this way to do this? Well, because the problem is that work stress, school stress, social stresses, they're not going to go away. How we deal with them is, is, you know, is what psychologists tell you, right? And they're absolutely correct. But um, they're not going to go away. So this is where my two buddies and mine and I started saying we need to get people to connect to nature. I've been an outdoor enthusiast, outdoor adventurer, and I just, and my buddies, he's a he was a professional adventure racer for a long time. He was he was he's retired from that. He's, he's been worked on Wall Street and all kinds of like that. He's he he just was out one day and and we were skiing together a couple of days later. He's like, when I'm outside, I just feel better. I'm just happy. I go for a walk and I'm happy. And why is that? He's asking me the physiologist. I'm like, well, you know, blah, 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 right, and making stuff up. And so we started looking that there's a actually pretty robust literature out there on this. Right, it's amazing actually at the literature on that. And so. When you get exposed to nature, like true nature, I mean, it's just, I'll explain this in a second, but within 20 minutes of being in nature and, we, and, and being immersive in nature, your blood pressure drops, heart rate, uh, your drops, you get improved heart rate variability if you believe in that kind of stuff. Um, you have uh, levels of cortisol and norepinephrine decrease. Your, measure, your measures of mood and anxiety improve. You get improved sleep after you've been outside. There's a lot of studies showing this and a lot of powerful studies. I'm a physiologist. I've been ignoring this stuff. I mean, how, right? The deal is you need to put that damn phone away, right? They have studies that have shown if you're engaged in your phone and you're out in nature, you don't see these benefits, right? So you have to put that phone away. So it's all part of the biophilia hypothesis. Humans possess an innate tendency to seek out connections with nature and other forms of life, including other people, right? And this has been taken in Japan to extreme uh, extents where they have what's called Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing. And it's been so powerful that the government funded a, a small study, put a park in and want to see how people health improved. It was so successful. They, they're, they're pushing all these parks to be developed and encouraging people to take time away and go do forest bathing. What is that? It's not, no, it's not stripping naked and going forest. It, it's just bathing yourself in nature and relaxing, right? That's what it is. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen your TikTok. I told you. I told you. Right. So the, the bottom line is that nature equals health is backed by hundreds of published studies. Right. I don't know how long I'm doing the time here. Um, ooh, getting tight. We started a little bit late, I guess, when I started. But um, so I'll show you two real quick studies. This is a, an acute study, but they had uh, people who were in, in a hospital in a, a, a clinic who had um, a major depressive disorder. And they just had people go and they either walked to the city 
right? The 15 minute walk to the city or they walk this arboretum next next to it, right? And, and what do you think happens? Mood, short-term memory, both improve dramatically following the walk in nature versus urban environment. They had the same walk, right? And, this, and, and, and yet they just saw nature. So a lot of hospitals have recognized this. And if, if you've got a view of nature, people, the health times, the, use, the, the people recover from hospitals faster. It's insane. Like the, you start looking at the data and you're like, how do you know this? People with screen savers can be more productive of, of nature or of, of plants on a desk will have a little bit more productivity. You can change it. So start changing your, 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 what you can see and do. And your exercise room you guys got, whoo, that's awesome. You got some nice views out there. Maybe not nature per se completely, but it's pretty dang nice, right? Um, uh, Richard Taylor is a, is a is a physics professor at Oregon, and in, in uh, just about a year ago here, he he had this study that I didn't know he was working on, and he found and he does um he's this guy who does these studies where um against psychologists, and he who's really famous and look at like science or one of those big journals that people say are important. He um he said he he showed that um people prefer to look at Jackson Pollock paintings versus one that's not a Jackson Pollock that doesn't look like it, and he started analyzing the paintings and he found that. When Jackson Pollock painted, he created fractals. And fractals that we see in nature is repeating patterns, right? We find that soothing, we find that pleasant, right? And so um, so he's, he's, he's published that, that work. And so that's one of the things like why going in nature is gonna make you happier, right? Um, if you even live near nature, so this is a, a, a this is from a Rojas uh, Rueda, who he's a professor, um, environmental studies professor in uh, Colorado State, and this is a, a big um, uh, uh, meta analysis. Okay, over eight million people on this. So all this is kind of showing you is that if you're at the left of this line here for all these studies, um, that's going to favor all cause mortality prevention. If you're on this side of things then it's going to favor all cause uh, mortality um, rise. It's just worse for you, right? And then what he did is he looked, he looked at uh, all these um, a greenness around where people live, right? And if you just live, and this is after, and you, of course, you got to take into socioeconomic status. You got to take into the horrible uh, racial injustices that have been created in this, in this world and this country um, by segregating the, the poor and more racially diverse groups into the areas with less nature and you know the the the, the wealthy white people getting to live in the areas with more nature and more parks and, and and then you get more money from the state and then you will put more parks into the wealthy places right you even consider all that the the more the more healthy more green space around your home the healthier you're going to be Okay, cleaner air, less noise, uh, uh, more activity to, to want to walk outside, all these things. And so this is a very, very powerful study in 8 million people showing this and with significant changes. Um, starting to see things now where um, uh, insurance companies are getting very excited about this because if they can start saying, if you uh, can go and spend time in nature, right, you're going to see reductions in, in healthcare costs to about $378 per person um, who are getting over some threshold of nature exposure. Um, so we, I put this together a long time ago, or not, I guess a couple of years ago, but it's, it's too too busy for all this. But the bottom line is, is all these different things you get in nature, green exposure, um, views of nature, walks in nature, these all have some active ingredients, right? You, there's, the, there's the natural, um, uh, just the natural sounds, the, the, the fractals you're gonna see, you get some vitamin D exposure, um, reduction in the bad things and noise pollution by having more green spaces. Then it's going to be all these physiological and psychological states. All the green ones are going to be improved, and all the dark ones, the stress and that kind of stuff, cortisol, are all going to go down, right? And then our behaviors can change. Um, you put really nice parks and have um, tree canopies that are up high enough where you can see each other, and they're meeting places for people. People are going to go there and flock there and be there, and it's going to help build communities, right? And that community is a huge part of it as well. Um, and then the health outcomes are going to be obvious, right? People are going to live longer. There's going to be uh, uh, birth weights of babies is going to go up. All the kind of stuff that we know are, are associated with positive health go up and things that are bad go down. So it's really, really, really quite powerful. And I think it's greatly underutilized by student populations, like faculty populations, right? And I'm guilty of this as well. So so we started as well. So um, uh, Rachel Hopman started this, this she's a, a, a neuroscientist at Northeastern. And she kind of put this with this little prescription because we like, we like to quantify ourselves, right? To some degree. And she has this idea that, you know, for mental health, follow the 25, three rule. That means get into nature environment for at least 20 minutes, three times per week, right? And that means a true nature environment as best as you can. Spend five hours per month in a semi-wild environment like a state park, right? And try and spend three days per year off the grid in nature. And so when you're in, the, in nature or you're in the wild environment, 
you know, leave your phone off or leave it. Don't take it out. Don't look at it. Leave it at home if you can. Right. So these are great nature goals. Um, so in this company we formed, um, Nature Quant, one of our products is Nature Dose. And it's it's an app, it's on iOS, it's iOS, it's on Android phones, 100% free. And I know you're gonna say, wait, you made an app for exposing to nature. And I, I realize the irony there, but the truth is we gotta meet people where they are, especially for kids and other individuals. And we like the quantified self. I'm wearing aura ring, I see a whole bunch of Garmin watches and other things like that. We like to know, ooh, did I sleep well? Ooh, was my HRV? Ooh, what was my body temperature? Did it go up, right? Um, all those kind of facts we like to know, and it's helped us to make good choices. By wearing this damn thing, I learned that if I have a glass of wine after eight o'clock, my sleep is disrupted. That was devastating. I mean, sorry, that was really good for me to know that, right? It made me happy, but 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 it, I saw it was a clear pattern. First time I'm like, no, right? I'm going to have wine tomorrow night and see what happens. <laughs> um, and sure enough, it, it's very, very consistent with me. So quantifying ourselves is good. And so we create this app that is Dimensions free, so you can download it right now from all the stores, whatever. It's available in, in uh, uh, all North America right now. Um, we're having a little trouble in, in parts of Mexico, um, but then we're going to expand to um, uh, Europe and Central America and South America, um, other other wares as well. But the idea is is it, it tracks you. It, it has to be have your. It, it follows GPS, has accelerometers, all kinds of like that. Works your phone to really. The science behind it is way beyond my ability. My my buddies are great at that kind of thing. But what it's doing is tracking your your time in nature. So if you go to a natural park or even a city park, for every minute you're in that nature environment, um, then you're going to get a minute of nature dose, right? If you go and walk on this campus here, and I'll show you the campus here in a moment, um, uh, it, it's not 100% natural. It's actually on the lower end where, we, where I was earlier. It's like a 30% of zero to 100 of like total natural utopia, zero, like you got nothing. Um, you're about 30 to 40, depending on where I was on campus. That means you're going to get 30 to 40% of your time outside nature, right? But if you but if you go close to more green spaces, go to a park, then it, then it all goes up, right? And it's tracking you throughout the day. And yet you can have it set up to show your inside outside time. And it can show you your uh, cumulative time for that for the week. And you can set your goals. So we want people to try and set for at least uh, 90 minutes, but if you can, 120 minutes per, per week. And the great thing is, is that we don't have it set up where you go like, oh, I'm at 17 minutes. Oh, I'm at 18 minutes, right? It won't aggregate the data until you're back somewhere else. And, and so we don't want people having their phone out. People say, well, what if I leave it at home? We're like, that's even better. But then we'll get my nature dose. I'm like, yeah, that's true. So we're trying to get into watches and other things. And, and so there's we're working with companies to try and make that happen in the aura ring that people are interested. So bottom line is, is, is it's it's a, it's we're hoping people are going to use this. And we have um, studies at uh, Harvard, Clemson, Minnesota, two at Oregon, um, uh, University of Texas, uh, Arlington, Arlington, Austin, um, and a couple other places that are starting to use this in their research and um, try and get kids to to uh, um, uh, try and get adolescents to try and and use nature spells, trying to get college students to doing it, trying and get nurses to do it, doing all these different things, right? And so if you can quantify it, then you can come the weekend and say, "Wow!" And and I'm great at this, right? I'm I was just super disappointed sharing with somebody. I can't remember who it was. My nature score for for this week, and it's and it's horrible. Right, because I've been traveling and I was busy and yada yada, um, and so it, but that reminds me. Okay, I got to get out to nature some this week, and I got to try and get my nature dose up. Right, so it's, it's free to use. Uh, we gain no money whatsoever from you using it. So if you like it, fantastic. If you don't like it, let us know why not. Um, but hopefully, by quantifying yourself, you're learning more about yourself, and it's another another that piece. We'd love to be the the, the next ring on the Apple Watch sub thing. Um, they haven't bid on that yet, but I think. But I think they're working on something similar, but they won't do as good as we can. I don't think we'll find out, right? Yeah. So the, the bottom line is when we think of the pillars of wellness, the Global Wellness Institute is saying um, nature is one of those pillars, along with diet, exercise, and sleep. So it's, it's if you start tapping, it's going to be like shocked how much great data there is and information there is. And it's just not getting translated enough. And so why I'm talking about it. Um, yeah. So my goal every day, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of breath, get hot, get cold, get outside, just get doing something, Whoop, get together, right? There's just something. Um, that's my, my goal. And I will tell you, there are a lot of days I don't exercise, but I'm, I, I, I'm like, do I believe in sauna? Yeah, I've built a sauna in my house. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm, a, I'm a like hair club for men. I'm not only the, uh, uh, the, the president, I use it too, right? Something like that. Um, but oftentimes I'll do a cold stress just because I, I don't, it's so quick and easy, right? And getting outside is easy. Um, especially when you live in, 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 in your natural areas. Yeah, so billing people to thank. Um, this is actually a short list and I need to update it a little bit. Um, as I said before, um, 
it's really easy for me to surround myself with people smarter than me. And, and, and these are some of them. They're just fantastic. And uh, funding is huge as well, obviously. Got to have tons of funding and I've been super lucky with uh, all these groups. So with that, um, thanks. Really hope that wasn't too preachy. We have time for one question. And then we have to speak. Um, so I have this um, thought about finding one of your therapy and therapy to slow down. And I'm too comfortable with any substance. Do you have any written any written history that you're working on in that matter? Yeah, we haven't done cold stress on the spinal cord injured. Um, we have, this is like my, one of my biggest shortcomings uh, or frustrations is we had a really great study and funding to look at spinal cord injured and doing heat therapy. And we, we put a number, we did acutely and we did chronically and the chronic adaptations were massive in that group. So I, but the problem is in, in Eugene, it's a pretty small community and we don't have enough people to sample tip to pop to do it. And we don't have a big rehab hospital or VA hospital there. So I've given I've given my complete grant to three different groups now, like just based sentence that do this right, and things written, change it however you want. And so um, uh, one of them uh, uh, one of them now has funding to do spinal cord injury. He's up at the big uh, spinal cord injury group at, at uh, UBC, uh, British Columbia, and um, they're starting the studies. And uh, the, the the data we have so far, I need to write it up. It's only I think it's like six subjects or something like that that we have. And we're seeing profound improvements. The, the challenge is, um, and we were doing, um, uh, we're doing paraplegic. So one of the groups is arranged in, para, in, in tetraplegic. So it's a little harder to get them in and out of the tub, right? And that kind of thing. Um, and they can't, you gotta be careful if they don't burn themselves, especially that's why we're using water because you're not gonna burn yourself in a hot tub as much as you could in a sauna. Um, so, uh, so I think it's very, very it's excellent for them. Um, I think it'd be, you know, when we, the, the challenge is, a lot of people with spinal cord injury, their blood pressure is really low. And so you got to be careful there. They don't, blood pressure doesn't drop further. Um, and that was one of our concerns, even with heat therapy, we saw in this, a few of the subjects, their blood pressure went lower. But the th I think we need to recalibrate though, how we think blood pressure and spinal cord injured, because if we use our standard values, that's not going to be relevant to them. So maybe they, they operate at a different level than or different version that we do. So maybe they are high, maybe they be high, not hypertensive by our numbers, but they're, by the spinal cord injury numbers, they're they're hypertensive, even though they're low. So that's not a long answer, but I think if it is, it is, um, it is, uh, I think it has real, real big potential. Yeah, I'll stick around for as long as people want. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's a great question, right? And so um, we've seen this this pandemic. Like, there's places I go where like no one's ever here, and I'm like, holy crap, everyone's here, right? Um, so you just got to get yourself farther out. But that's right. So like this, yeah. There's a there's a there's a this is a big place. There's a lot of nature. But but to your point though, my goal much more than 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 trying to make the outdoors crowded is first invest in green spaces and cities. And one of my my good buddies at Oregon, he's like one of the top uh, sustainable cities uh, scientists, and uh, the whole group of them there. And um, they're saying really the solution to so many of our problems is getting more people into cities, right? Because it, it's because the urbanization was causing a lot of problems for us because people were driving in and out, and yes, people can remote work, but it, right, whatever. So um, so we got to get more people in cities, but we have to invest in green spaces and cities, and we have to invest in the areas where we have not been doing that. Right. I would love to see some of those freaking golf courses. I, I do play golf horribly, just only because my son's into it. The golf courses in Arizona where they're watering. God sakes, why? Turn those into parks. Do you get you get all kinds of people out there, even in even you know, early mornings, late at nights, whatever. You know, so um I think the investment in green, and so you can see, even if you're you're not saying a natural we, we can take more more um abandoned buildings, knock them down and create parks, right? And in, in in green spaces, you can greenify a lot of streets, and that is going to make a big difference. Um, so yeah, so I'm sensitive to getting too many people out there, but who? I'm not trying to pick on you, and so please don't take it that way. But but who do we see out in the wilderness? Rich white people, right? That's the bottom line. 
and that's not right. So there's all kinds of groups trying to get more um, diverse populations out to appreciate and be feel safe in nature, right? Um, and so, and that's that's not a small task to overcome. Um, so it's a uh, yeah, it's 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 an issue, but we got to start somewhere. I love the question, Lynn. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.